President, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, I was very pleased to follow your speech here, Mr. President, because the uh, role of San Gidio, the community of San Gidio, is a, is a very important role when you analyze the results that it obtained during the last 20, 25 years. I remember quite well uh, the role when uh, the question of the uh, Mozambique was uh, critically uh, at some stage, and then through the help of San Desidio, uh, you rightly pointed out that, that plague. And I'm, I'm, I'm stressing this because we are talking about peace. I remember when the first organization about the OSC at that time was the CSC, 1973. Uh, which you remember quite well, when it was uh, launched in uh, Helsinki, we as a small country, Malta, we insisted at that time, and we blocked the, the agreement until it was there, pointed there, included there in the chapter, that you cannot talk about peace if you don't include the Mediterranean. Because if you don't include the Mediterranean, you are excluding many communities. You are excluding an important religion, which is in the area, which is the Islam. So when you talk about peace, you have to include everything without any discrimination. You have to ensure that you have to give the rights, equal rights to the minorities without any discrimination. And this is the paper that I try to present and I'm going to present today to you, uh, your excellencies. First of all, I want, I want to thank uh, Mark uh, uh, the Director General, for giving me this opportunity to address this audience. Uh, and I want to also to thank also those previous keynote speakers who were always uh, were, um, excellent. I, I'm, I'm seeing the Bishop of Philippines here and, uh, and many others who, who gave during this three days conference. But while there is sufficient scope to say that cultural diplomacy in its wider terms Sometimes it's hard to explain. I came across a very important statement by uh, a certain Cynthia Schneider. Actually, Cynthia Schneider wrote the uh, book about cultural diplomacy, hard to define. It's a publication of 2006. But she said this, it's a very important statement. Cultural diplomacy is always there for all to see and to employ. A very simple statement, but it's very significant statement. Unfortunately, however, in the recent past, the 9-11 cultural diplomacy resuscitated only to a false alarm. As in many instances, it was much discussed, even if sometimes little understood, in terms of its role, that is the role of diplomacy, as a catalyst for change when applied to uh, a particular conflict resolution mechanisms. In fact, agents of doom and gloom uh, chose to portray a world with a bleak future. And this is where the uh, top politicians were mistaken. They talk about us and them. There's always a division. You and they. This resurfaced uh, as the sole component that justifies, as it did in Iraq, for example, military intervention uh, or occupation in a particular uh, area in the name of peace and order. In the name of peace and order. I, I don't have to remind what Tony Blair said, what George Bush said, and many others. In the name of peace and order. Indeed, our time could be described as one of constant transition. We are in a constant transition. On the one hand, you have Europe that economically has just started to sort of come out, or we are being convinced it's coming out from a prolonged economic crisis, although we know that on the other hand, we have millions of disgruntled young citizens including in Italy and many other countries, who saw their hopes of engaging in a decent job die away. So you have to talk about peace 
and how you are going to convince the young people that you want peace and they don't have a job. They don't have even the money to live a decent life. So it comes as no surprise that emphasis on dialogue has once again uh, come to the fore that any attempt at effective peace-building measures should start from a clear, very clear understanding of what constitutes our belief. Connecting with the people's needs is one belief. And understanding the concerns or their concerns with adequate respect to that notion of truth is one way how bridges, you mentioned that, uh, Your Excellency, how bridges could actually start being built. You cannot have bridges when you have a lot of questions unanswered. So culture is, co uh, is a coefficient agent that has the potential to bring both change in a given situation and, and I have to add this, a positive attitude towards new things. You have to think about new things. In a way, the Catholic Pontifical Council for Interreligious Dialogue, which, if I'm not wrong, was established, you mentioned, in 1964, uh, as a result of the Vatican Council II, I have to confess, is a claim in the right direction. It was a claim in the right direction. However, openness towards the truth is openness towards individuals, societies, and states that require constructive connectivity. I have to quote another important person. In, in a sense, uh, I refer to an American. I have to not sound that I'm anti-American. I mean, there are good Americans who did state very important, valuable uh, uh, statements. I'm referring to Jeffrey Wiseman, who is the author of the book uh, Pan-American Bumping into Diplomatic Culture. Uh, it, is, uh, it is on Pax Americana. He said this, we seem to have neglected a long time the deeply rooted state-based diplomatic culture with its own distinctive institutions, values, and norms. Such neglect, he said, may have unwanted repercussions of no small proportion, like the 2003 invasion of the Iraq, the Arab Spring in Northern Africa, and obviously the ongoing, ongoing instability in the Middle East. So such claims, while proffering a roadmap which puts culture as an agent of change, also tends to unfold an age-long reality. We have been talking about the Middle East since time immemorial. I mean, I remember 1996, because Malta tried to play quite a role uh, to enforce peace. I remember 1996 when we were in government. We managed to convince, at the time, Yitzhak Rabin, who was the Israeli prime minister, to come to Malta. And we convinced also, at the time, Yasser Arafat, uh, the late Yasser Arafat, to come to Malta to have a summit about peace. And by that time, uh, there was also with Rabin, if I'm not mistaken, yes, uh, the Minister of Foreign Affairs of the Israeli government at the time, he's still alive, David Levy. And when I spoke to David Levy, I thought how hard it is that at least you sit down on a table and shake hands uh, and talk about coffee or tea or something, but don't talk about uh, Palestine or, or Israel, talk about something that you can have a smile. This is the way that we could do it because Malta, like other countries, we had a very good speech yesterday by the, our Australian uh, uh, politician. We are a neutral country. We tried 
to convince our neighbors that you can have peace if you want to be neutral. You can be neutral and you have your open participation that you can be credible. And once you entrench that in your constitution, which we did, we have a neutrality constitution. We don't. We did that when there was still the Soviet Union and the and the and the West of the headed by uh, NATO and the United States. But we said no. We don't want to put into no bloc. We want to have a neutral country because we want to make peace in the area. In order to make peace, you have to be a credible country with the neighbors. So you don't have to have bases in your country. So that was one of the reasons why we said to the British way back 35 years ago. We, we, we like your presence, but please, now you have to leave. We don't want more British bases or any other armed forces or foreign bodies to be in our country. Why? Because we wanted peace. It is a value, but you have to work for it. And here is the value and the perception of the tools that either are available, or if they are not available, you have to make sure that you work with these people. And that's why Malta played a role. Uh, play the role also in, in other methods. We tried to play a very re recent role with the Libyans, but we're still away, uh, far away, uh, uh, because there were other interests who were rushed during the Libyan revolution, but the interest of certain countries was not exactly the interest of having a united Libya and uh, the interest of peace. So the degree of confidence and I come now to religion. The degree, degree of confidence that religion has on people can replace confidence, and this is very important, on long-tested political failures. Why I'm saying this? Where is the role of religion, in my opinion? In societies in which the government is widely viewed either as illegitimate or centralized authority has broken down completely, organized religion may be the only, may be, it could be, and possibly be, the only institution retaining some measure of credibility, trust, and moral authority among the population at large. So, therefore, what sometimes is undervalued claim towards the religious potential in peace-building operations should come forward as a valuable a depository of experience which connects with people's immediate needs and fears, thus enabling uh, a better understanding of a particular situation on the ground. I'm sure that this cannot take place if one moves in a direction where religion continues to be considered as a region which should stay away from political involvement. Such claim of distinct separation between religion and state, while surely makes sense in situations where the mere mention of religion regrettably fuels disgruntlement, in other cases, it may be the determining factor to reconciliation between opposite parties. We have these situations. We just had the examples mentioned by my previous speaker, the President Santa Gidio. Hence the need to adopt a diplomatic outlook towards specific scenarios where the involvement of religion provides the required structure to work for peace and faith directions. One such case, I'm sure, and I've been emphasizing this all the time wherever I go and my, make my presentations, is the Middle East peace process, which, while badly in need of reconciliation of the opposing parties, will not take place unless, and I repeat, unless there is the involvement of religious believers sharing the same negotiation table alongside secular actors. You cannot exclude these people. Indeed, religion should be part of the solution and not part of the problem. Especially, uh, and especially if religious uh, practices counter messages of hate and cause for violence by fostering mercy, by fostering forgiveness, by fostering 
reconciliation. If we really want to change, if we really want to change in the dynamics of what may constitute true peace building processes, I think it is imperative, it is essential that one points out the importance attached to the fundamental need for all religions to reach out to one another. All religions to reach out to one another. As much as recognize the wealth of experience they possess and which could bring forward to the service of peace and reconciliation among nations. In other words, and I come back to the Catholic religion because ecumenism or the need of dialogue among religions is the backbone, is the backbone upon which any discourse related to interreligious appreciation and commitment towards closer collaboration could actually take place and flourish. Such claim towards openness and mutual recognition took a radical turn with the promulgation of the uh, Pope Paul VI, uh, Nostra Etate. Uh, that was in 1965, uh, a Vatican Council II declaration on the relationship of the Catholic Church and non-Christian religions. Another significant initiative towards more interfaith understanding among different religions was the setting up of the World Conference on Religion and Peace, a symbol of goodwill among Christians, Jews, Muslims, Hindus, and Buddhists. Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, all attempts, both attempts, while recognizing the need to enhance assimilation, the pooling of ideas made one important statement, namely that notwithstanding the dogmatic differences that we can have, the faith perceptions between religions, all of us should work, should seek to work harder and bolder towards retaining unity in diversity. It is only with such universal claim that any extra religious reconciliation could possibly become more equivocal and less paradoxical, especially in view of the profound sense of ultimacy that religions in their own right seek to proclaim. On the other hand, cultural diplomacy is a basic tenant employed to bring about the much needed change for the better. Any attempt to safeguard a balanced social environment is to make the democratic narrative more comprehensive at the needs of the individuals. Dear friends, this could only take place if all parties stop and listen to what the other has to say. You have to have a good ear. You have to have patience. You have to listen. Pope Francis, we just saw him this morning, uh, me and Mark, we tried to get closer, but we did have a good shot of him. Uh, he has emphasized this concept in his message prepared in this year World Communication Day, when he said that we should rediscover the beauty of the neighborlessness. It is a communication. Communication is really about realizing that we are all human beings. We are all children of God. Unfortunately, it is most true that in today's world, very few people feel well listened to by others. Some are not even listened. Children in some countries have barely the rights to be listened. It is telling that in spite of the advances in communication and technology, that we all have our, at our disposal, whether with an iPhone and whatever, you, you say it, Twitter, Facebook, everybody has any kind of communication. We still continue to find it hard to break the barriers that make our relationship better and much more open to reconciliation. Indeed, many of the conflicts have their basis in simply inadequate listening to one another. Most noteworthy is the continuity in both message and manner 
of application adopted by both Pope Francis and blessed soon to be declared the Pope John Paul II. Their attitude towards uh, an ecumenism based on the cohorts of extended communication has all the qualities that, and that address the dangers attached to a culture of artificial proclivity that choose to ignore the detail for want of more urgent homogeneous results. Uh, I have to share what Dalai Lama said. When he received the Nobel Prize uh, in 1989 in Oslo, he said this. He said, the problems we face today, the violent conflicts, the destruction of nature, poverty, hunger, and so on, are human created problems, which can be resolved through human effort, understanding, and a development of a sense of brotherhood and sisterhood. It seems, in my opinion, as if these words were said yesterday. Your Excellencies, I have to conclude. I'd like to stress that our aim as politicians, religious leaders, is to continue leading by example, giving our respective peoples a true sense of belonging and their co-sharing in the decisions that we take. In my view, it is only through the enhancement of such vivid involvement that surpasses religion as much as the communal experience of faith that we could aspire and aspire to reach a common objective of happiness and peaceful existence for all. Thank you very much.